There was a film clip on YouTube doing the rounds a few years ago called It's Not About the Nail. Look it up, obviously, after the service is finished rather than right now. It begins with a view of a woman who is talking about how she's feeling. It's that it's all this pressure, you know, she says, and it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it, like it's in my head and I don't know that it's going to stop and that's the thing that scares me most, that I don't know that it's ever going to stop. As she talks, the camera pans out and we see that the woman is sitting on a sofa and there is a man next to her whom we assume is her partner. But what also becomes apparent for the first time is that there is a six inch nail sticking straight out of the woman's forehead. And the man is looking at the nail and responds to the woman's impassioned speech about her feelings. Yeah, then there's a pause. You do have a nail sticking out of your head. To which the woman replies, it's not about the nail. But he continues to assert <clears throat> that things might be better if she took the nail out, to which she replies angrily, you always do this. You always try to fix things, and I just want you to listen. And so the dialogue continues, and it becomes clear that what the woman needs and what her partner thinks she needs are two different things. And until the communication misalignment is cleared up, nothing will get sorted. There's quite a lot of that in the gospel passage we just heard. It's very easy to go diving into it and say to oneself, aha, this is about marriage and divorce. And that is indeed the surface subject of this passage. And I have duly looked up the commentaries and learnt more than I feel I need to know about marriage laws in the New Testament times. But it's not about the nail. The Pharisees are testing Jesus, as they do so often, and they're pretty sure they've got him this time. Regardless of his actual answer as to whether it is lawful for a man to divorce his wife, Jesus will certainly alienate at least one powerful group of people. But Jesus won't be trapped so easily. From a broad, hypothetical question, he turns the eye inward, and the question becomes personally, what did Moses command you? Jesus allows himself to be drawn into the question of marriage and divorce only to remind us that broken relationships of whatever kind leave damage in their wake. In New Testament times, it was very often the divorced woman who suffered Survival for a woman, especially one with children, involved being part of a household. If that was no longer the case, then she would have a great deal of difficulty supporting herself. She might well find herself on the margins of society, struggling to feed herself and her dependents, outcast and alone. What can be right about any law that results in this? Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's teaching his disciples not about spiritual powers, not about the laws set out in the Torah. He's teaching them how to live their lives in community in a way that supports and enriches every member from the strongest and most powerful right down to the weakest. It's not about the finer details of Mosaic law. It's about the gift God gave every person he created from the very beginning, the gift of relationship. What the disciples should be aiming for isn't a scrupulously drawn up document of who is in the right on which occasion, but covenant relationships built on mutual respect, integrity, self-sacrifice, honesty, forgiveness, and love. Relationships both between individuals and among communities that are about honoring and supporting every person so that they can fulfill their potential as children of God. This message is given emphasis by Jesus's actions immediately after this test. He blesses a bunch of children, the weakest, 
most vulnerable, most insignificant members of society at that time. In the new community that Jesus is building, no one is excluded, no one is left on the outside looking in. This is a community of love and of healing, one in which the broken and the wounded, those who have been battered by the storms of life on this earth, those who have fallen into error or walked a path that led them into the valley of the shadow of death, all will find a welcome. There does need to be some sort of structure, just as the nail does need to be removed from the woman's head. But the basis of this community is not the 600 odd commandments to be found in Leviticus, but on the two to be found two short chapters of Mark later. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's an ideal, of course it is, but it's the ideal towards which every Christian community should be working. Hearts and minds fixed on a goal, which while it might not be achievable on this earth, faulty, flawed, damaged human beings as we are, is certainly worth keeping in our hearts as the place worth heading for. So as we struggle on, seeking to understand the words of Christ, trying to live righteous lives, let us not strain at the gnats of what sort of idyllic model of relationship is the best or most biblical. Let us rather rejoice in our community and give thanks to God who in his love for us sent his son to live among us and show us how it's done. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. <laughs>